In this lecture, I'll be discussing terrorism and looking at state responses to terrorism. In this intro slide here, you can see some of the responses of the state of China to terrorism or in attempts to get prepared for terrorism. These are all terrorist preparedness exercises associated in and around the um, Olympics in Beijing. So some of the bigger questions to think about is what exactly constitutes terrorism? Is one person's terrorist another person's freedom fighter or might there be a more objective way to define terrorism and begin to analyze it and think about it in the global sphere? What have been the impacts of terrorist attacks? And certainly we saw this in the last lectures discussion of militarization in a variety of contexts within society as a whole. I'll start with the discussion of terrorism in general, drawing from Lawrence Kunzar's work, Rationality Wars and the War on Terror. From there I'll go into a discussion of the extent of terrorism globally, and we'll focus for the most part on the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, looking at the differences in how these attacks were received by differently situated publics, both place, race, and a gender matter in how individuals interpret the attacks of September 11th in the United States. Lawrence Kunzar's 2007 Rationality Wars and the War on Terror uh, looks at terrorism and social unrest. And what he attempts to do in this piece is come up with a, or utilize a definition of terrorism that has been utilized at the international level. He notes that the term terrorism comes from the French Revolution and through published definitions there's a general understanding of terrorism as essentially three components. First, it's a tactic utilized by groups of individuals who oppose stronger political or military organizations by asymmetrically weak groups to target non-combatants for death, injury, and property destruction. And finally, it is used to intimidate and put political pressure on dominant organizations. Kunzar does mention that the state can engage in state-sponsored terror, but this is different than terrorism under international definitions. Terrorism, the definition, can be applied consistently and scientifically even if governments use the definition uh, or in their application use this somewhat arbitrarily. Causes of terrorism from the literature range from descriptions of poverty, failed states, humiliation, relative poverty, religion, and cultural clashes. Lawrence Kunzar suggests that terrorists are, in fact, rational actors. And he develops this using the sigmoid utility curve. Terrorists are, in fact, rational, full uh, awareness of what they're doing and the resources. They have self-interested motives and, the con and they conduct, essentially, cost-benefit analysis in order to maximize one's satisfaction. Typically when we think about maximization of utility or satisfaction, we think about this in the context of the individual. The economically rational individual will make decisions which will benefit him or her. However, this is culturally based, as Kunzar points out, and utility is fa in fact overall based on the social environment within which one finds oneself. This could be a very individualistic level, but it also could be looking at different uh, levels of group organization. And so we see with uh, Kunzar's work in his application of the Sigma utility curve that the reference point for those involved in the terrorist attacks of 9-11 is within the cell or group itself. That is, they do not reflect the larger opinions of a organized religion or society, uh, including the nation state or state, uh, but rather they are rather specific to a particular group of individuals who are organized specifically to engage in terrorist activity. Hence, relative prestige along the lines of social status or wealth is measured not by reference to larger society, but to and within the social group or the terror cell. 
He notes, utilizing the sigmoid utility curve, that individuals will tend to join and participate where they can maximize their utility and minimize their loss. Hence, it's those individuals who have much to gain by participation and relatively little to lose that will choose to participate in terrorist activities. Kunzar has used this sigmoid utility model in a variety of cross-cultural contexts and in his analysis of the co-conspirators of the 9-11 attacks he finds that 17 of the 19 co-conspirators in the 9-11 attacks indeed fall within the sigmoid utility curve so the model fits for explaining the behavior of 17 of the 19 co-conspirators in the attacks of September 11, 2001. So thinking about Kunzar's and others' definition of terrorism, we can look at the statistics on terrorism and consider this in light of what has become the war on terror. Uh, and you can see here from this figure, which comes from the Institute for Economics and Peace, that there has been an upswing in the number of terrorist attacks uh, across the globe numbering at about 17,000 uh, total deaths which have been caused by terrorist attacks in um, 2013. Uh, they note that the number of people who have died from terrorist activity has increased fivefold since the year 2000. If you look at the uh, statistics from the same organization, the Institute for Economics and Peace, you can see that across the globe there is a wide variety in terms of the impacts of terrorism. The states that are represented in the darker colors on this map have higher rates of incidence of terrorism and have the highest impact uh, on uh, of terrorist activities. Uh, as they point out, this is mostly situated in five countries. So in thinking about probably one of the, the, the biggest events uh, of the last uh, couple decades, we can see uh, the attacks of September 11th, 2001, that were designed to attack key sites of both economic and uh, political power, military might within the United States. Uh, so the question, a lot of scholars, of course, have talked about September 11th, whether this is a distinct moment in time, the idea that America is no longer a safe haven, and is rather a place where anything could happen uh, next. Is this, in fact, the beginning of history or a rupture uh, overall? Uh, is this a, a break within history? Certainly, we saw in the last lecture on militarism, the formation of new landscapes ideologies as well as normative behavior and a real struggle between notions of structure and freedom in terms of laws that are either protecting the rights of citizens or encouraging the responsibility of, of citizens or monitoring said responsibility through surveillance. There were a number of questions about why these attacks happened. Um, some of the, the pop song, one of the pop songs of this was Alan Jackson's where were you when the world stopped turning? And you know, in this particular song, he talks about the the idea of uh, just a common guy who doesn't really know um, all that much about uh, Iraq and Iran, even though he's watching the news on a regular basis. Now, the attacks of September 11th, 2001, have been framed uh, in a number of different ways and positioning matters quite a bit. As the political leaders of the United States attempted to frame the attacks of September 11th as attacks on fundamental freedoms, particularly George uh, W. Bush's presidential address of September 20th, 2001, just a few short days after the terrorist attacks, he noted the explanation for why the terrorist attacks occurred, noting that it revolved around the idea of freedom. He said they hate our freedoms, our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, our freedom to vote and assemble and disagree with each other. Now this is markedly different from what his 
Attorney General, from what the U.S. Attorney General John Ashcroft said just a few short months later on December 11th, 2001. He said, to those who put Americans against immigrants and citizens against non-citizens. And here he was specifically referencing a lot of the uh, particular attacks on particular segments of the population. But this point I think here is interesting, this next one, and I think it's fundamentally against what George W. Bush was getting at when he noted that part of freedom was the ability to disagree with each other. Ashcroft continues, to those who scare peace-loving people with phantoms of lost liberty. My message is this, your tactics only aid terrorists for they erode our national unity and diminish our resolve. They give ammunition to America's enemy and pause to America's friends. So here Ashcroft refers to those who are scaring peace-loving people with phantoms of lost liberty. If one is scaring a peace-loving person, this would indicate that they themselves are not a peace-loving person. And the idea that these are phantoms of lost liberty, that liberty has not truly been lost. I believe Ashcroft is referring here specifically to the resistance to the USA Patriot Act and those that have been critical with the USA Patriot Act and its relatively quick uh, movement through both houses of Congress and being signed into the law. He notes here that resistance or the idea of disagreement is perhaps not permissive because it actually aids terrorists. It only aids terrorists because it erodes our national unity and diminishes our resolve. So there's this sense from Ashcroft as well as former President Bush of this idea of national unity and this idea of, of peace and uh, peace loving and free individuals. But as anthropologists have demonstrated, it depends quite a bit from where individuals are situated within social hierarchies how they will read the events of September 11th. Jacob Zewey, in her 2006 piece, looks at African-American responses in comedy clubs. And it certainly is true that you can say quite a bit more in a joke than you can say seriously. Uh, these jokes were very specific. Uh, they were successful when they were in um, African-American comedy clubs and less successful uh, when they went out to other audiences as a whole. And so some of the jokes revolved around the idea that uh, white people were getting uh, African Americans in trouble again, that uh, white people were passive, uh, what happened to the white people as a whole who had not been passive in the past, who had uh, in fact enslaved Africans and dispossessed and killed Native Americans, um, that they would not in fact have been scared with the weapons that the terrorists brandished on the plane. Also jokes about white people being suspects now, getting pulled out of line, and noting that this is somehow uh, different than in the past, where uh, whereas racial profiling in the past seemingly only worked way, one way, now everyone was a potential suspect, including white people. They also point out that the benefits that uh, accrued to uh, African Americans were a result of the movement away of rights of Arab Americans as a whole. And the idea of full citizenship that African Americans only get to be full citizens when the United States as a whole wanted something from them. So Jacob Zewey works with Mattingly and Lawler and they do a series of focus groups in uh, Los Angeles and they are uh, these focus groups are groups of 8 to 12 women who are sitting around and talking about particular issues of concern to them. They're undirected uh, focus groups, which means there are no prompts to start them out. And they, um, Mattingly Lawler and Jacob Zui, go ahead and record these focus groups and what participants are saying and then do a content analysis of it. And what they find is that September 11th, the events of September 11th, 2001, the attacks on the World Trade Center, Pentagon, and Congress, were in fact uh, 3,000 miles away. Um, and they were a really discrete moment in time 
and it, they didn't really fundamentally change anything in the everyday lives of individuals. 